Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for attending our webinar on how OCD is treated. I'm Taylor Neuendorp. I'm an OCD specialist. Uh, I've been in practice for the past 14 years. Um, and for about the past nine to 10 years, my primary specialty has been treating OCD. Um, I worked in a partial hospitalization program that focused solely on the treatment of anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and for the last six years, I've been running my own private practice here in Chicago. It's called Chicago Counseling Center. And a vast majority of the people that we do treat here in our practice uh, do meet criteria for obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, in addition, I'm also a clinical advisor uh, for the app NoCD and I am a NoCD pro here in Illinois. And I'll tell you some more about the different services that the NoCD pros offer uh, through the app as far as treatment goes. So I do wanna take some time to address the four main questions um, that were prepared for this webinar. Those are how I can get help for OCD. Um, is it possible to actually get better? The answer is yes, I'll get more into that. Um, and then talk some about the specific treatments for OCD, what treatments are proven to be the most effective and helpful, uh, and what different treatment options are out there. So first of all, when I'm talking about how to get help for OCD, um, it's really important to have a solid understanding of why it is so important to see a treatment provider who truly specializes in and understands obsessive compulsive disorder itself. OCD continues to be misunderstood uh, even by professionals uh, in the field of psychology and psychiatry. Uh, because it's not uh, so well understood, unfortunately it is often misdiagnosed or even overlooked completely, even by very seasoned uh, clinicians in the, in the field. This can be for a number of reasons. Some of the symptoms that do tend to go along with OCD can sometimes look like other things. Uh, for example, if you're seeing a therapist who's not that familiar with OCD and you're trying to describe your intrusive thoughts or obsessions to them, they might just consider more of a general worry that might go along with something like general anxiety. Um, there are more unfortunate misunderstandings that can occur in our field. Um, it is very common for people with OCD to struggle with intrusive thoughts related to harm, for example. Um, and if people are trying to express some of the content of these very distressing and upsetting obsessions they're experiencing, they can be misconstrued uh, for the person actually wanting to commit some sort of harmful act to themselves or others. Um, and that's simply not the case with, with OCD. So those are just a couple quick examples of understanding why it's so important to see someone who has education, training, and a good amount of clinical experience specifically addressing OCD. So how do you find these people? Um, it's not easy. There are not that many of us out there, uh, but we're trying to get more of us out there. Um, the best sources to go to are to go through organizations that do really focus in kind of gathering as many resources and referrals as possible uh, for OCD. Uh, the NoCD app itself has compiled a list of treatment providers. Um, also, the International OCD Foundation has a, a very solid list of treatment providers uh, on their site as well. Um, these are probably the best sources to go to because in these cases, if you go through the treatment provider list on NoCD, um, everybody listed on there has already been vetted, meaning people have already taken care of verifying that these people that are listed on um, their uh, provider directories do have the specialized training necessary to, to really understand it and treat the OCD itself. Having said that, um, it's still important to kind of interview a potential treatment provider, whether it's a psychologist, therapist, psychiatrist, whoever it may be. Um, don't be afraid to speak up, kind of advocate for yourself, and really ask some pointed questions to the provider as far as what their specific experience treating OCD is and what sort of treatment methods um, they have used when it comes to addressing the disorder itself. Uh, it's also completely appropriate to 
ask providers how many people roughly they think they've treated with OCD and what sort of treatment results they tend to see in the people they have worked with. So that kind of leads me to my next question I want to address, which is, is it possible to get better? And, and the answer, like I said earlier, is yes, definitely. Even as debilitating and kind of disruptive as the symptoms that go along with OCD can be at times throughout a person's life, um, there are very, very effective treatment modalities out there and specific skills that you as the individual can learn to kind of implement on your own to figure out how to better manage and overcome the OCD symptoms so you can get to a point where they're really not interfering with your life as much as they might have been at one point. Um, I am all about trying to help people attain a better quality of life. And simply put, when people are able to learn how to reduce and stop engaging in compulsive activities, they learn how to better tolerate things like anxiety, distress, discomfort, and tolerate even just experiencing obsessions and intrusive thoughts, they are starting to experience a higher quality of life. So as far as the actual treatment methods um, that can help people get to that point in their lives where they feel like they're effectively managing whatever sort of symptoms they might be experiencing, sort of the gold standard in the field is what is known as exposure and response prevention or ERP. So exposure and response prevention comes out of a general field of treatment known as cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, in a very brief nutshell, is simply getting a solid understanding of how your thoughts, your feelings, and your behaviors all impact one another. Um, we may not be fully aware of this, but at almost any given moment throughout our lives, those three things are really coming into play. Thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. The way we're thinking about things kind of influences how we're feeling both emotionally and physically. It can produce very real physiological sensations uh, in addition to any emotions like anxiety, depression, uh, anger, whatever it may be. And the way we're thinking and feeling have a direct influence on our behaviors. Um, those three things always at play all the time. What exposure and response prevention does, um, it kind of targets any sort of behaviors that might be going along with something like OCD. So if you think of compulsions, right, these are very much a behavior. People can have an outward physical compulsion they are engaging in. People also frequently engage in sort of mental rituals or mental compulsions. These are all behaviors. They're all a process people are going through more often than not to alleviate any sort of anxiety or distress that is associated simply with having obsessions, having intrusive, unwanted thoughts that the person would rather not experience. Exposure and Provence prevention is pretty much what it sounds like. It is actually purposely exposing yourself to something that tends to cause a certain amount of anxiety or distress for you and preventing your typical response which in most cases is the compulsion. Uh, what happens is the more someone is able to actually resist any sort of compulsive urge, the brain starts to engage in new learning, meaning the person really starts to understand that you do not need compulsions to alleviate distress. Distress and anxiety are things that will kind of ebb and flow and eventually fade on their own without you really doing anything about it. And once people start to learn that they can stop compulsions, tolerate distress, then they start to figure out that they don't have to really pay attention to the intrusive thoughts and obsessions they are experiencing. Exposure and prevent response prevention is something that some people think kind of sounds simple in theory, but uh, it is actually pretty tricky to implement effectively in practice. And that is why, again, it is so important that if you're gonna start working with someone on overcoming your OCD and engaging in a treatment protocol that follows along the lines of exposure and response prevention, you need to be working with someone who really understands the ins and outs of ERP and how it can work. Uh, some of the first steps that go along with ERP, 
um, is creating what is known as an anxiety hierarchy or a trigger list. It's a chance for you to kind of put down anything and everything you're experiencing that causes any amount of discomfort or anxiety or distress for you. Um, it can include things like intrusive thoughts. It can include certain situations, certain environments, people, memories, numbers, really, there's no right or wrong to it. And then working with an OCD specialist, they can help you create and then implement very spe specific exposures for any and all triggers you might have put down on your anxiety hierarchy. And there's a very systematic, structured way to go about this so that, again, over time, the person truly learns they can face all these different triggers. They can actually face these things that used to cause so much anxiety for themselves, resist any sort of compulsive urge to get rid of that feeling as quickly as they can, um, and simply get to the point, once again, where compulsions are not overtaking any parts of their daily lives anymore. So as far as different treatment options, um, again, you want to be finding someone who is specialized not just in treating OCD, but really knows uh, how to work most effectively with CBT and ERP. So again, kind of the best place to start to find these people would be through uh, the provider directory uh, on a site like uh, NoCD. NoCD has also started um, offering services, online therapy services, in a few uh, select states. Right now, um, you can talk with a NoCD pro like myself in states like Michigan, Illinois, Texas, Ohio, and California. And the goal of NoCD is to get to the point where they're providing um, treatment for people in all 50 states. What is great about the modality that uh, NoCD is using, and it's what I really enjoy being a NoCD pro myself, is that I can reach people anywhere in Illinois. I'm in Chicago, but Chicago does not <laughs> constitute all of the people in Illinois who might have OCD and might need help for it. So I can now interact and work with people in small towns uh, where there might not be a single person in their area who, again, really understands or specializes in treating OCD. Or even in a major metropolitan area like Chicago itself, there simply are not enough OCD specialists to treat everybody out there who meets criteria for OCD and wants and needs the help to get better. So the modality uh, that NoCD is using is great because we can reach people where they are. It's very uh, evidence-based. It is all based on ERP. Um, again, kind of the gold standard, the most effective treatment method out there. Um, and what I like about it is I can interact with people when they are in the environments where they might be engaging in compulsions the most, uh, environments where they might be most kind of stuck in their OCD. So I can work with someone while they're in their home. I can work with someone maybe out in a public area, again, trying to work on exposures with them in the moment, see how they're responding to the exposure process itself and kind of help them troubleshoot any areas uh, that, that they might need. So uh, I really like the option of having mobile therapy. Um, it is uh, kind of a nice blend between kind of traditional outpatient therapy where someone might come into an office, say, once a week to meet with someone. Um, it's, it's a little more intensive than that, but not as intensive as something like a full-on partial hospitalization program or a residential program for someone whose uh, OCD symptoms are that severe. Um, it allows me to... Uh, have a couple video sessions with the clients weekly um, and also the ongoing support feature is really, really important, meaning um, with a no CD pro, you are able to message that person uh, Monday through Friday anytime you want and the no CD pro gets back to you as soon as I can again to offer suggestions, offer feedback, kind of really keep a close tab on your progress as you're walking uh, through the exposure and response prevention piece that goes along with uh, no CD treatment. Now, if you're someone that happens to be outside of one of the states where uh, no CD currently offers uh, services with a no CD pro, a clinician like myself, um, again, you, you wanna fall back on those treatment provider directories. You really wanna be doing a, a good job of 
interviewing any potential therapists or psychiatrists you might be seeing uh, to see what their experience is with OCD. Um, just really briefly, some of the options are, again, seeing someone individually, maybe once or twice a week. Um, maybe uh, things have gotten severe enough for you that you do need a more structured program. Um, it would be a place you attend, say, maybe five to six hours, five days a week, or if things are really interfering with your life and you've gotten to a point where um, it's keeping you from work, it's keeping you from school, uh, really severely impacting your uh, ability to function uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, then there are um, kind of the most intensive level of care are residential treatment programs. So um, uh, along with that, uh, in a minute here, I'm going to take some of these questions and do my best to address all of them. Um, if uh, anybody out there has um, kind of gotten to the point where you really feel like you, you want and you need that help, uh, what we're offering through NoCD is a free 15-minute consultation with a member of the NoCD clinical team. So again, if you take advantage of this free consultation, you will be speaking with someone who is a verified OCD specialist, someone who knows their stuff, and you can tell them a little bit about what's going on for you, um, and they can give you even further treatment options as far as um, your course moving forward. Um, there is a sign up button through the chat. Uh, you can sign up for that free 15 minute consultation uh, today. Um, so I think we probably have a decent amount of time here um, if we wanna look through and just kind of start answering some of the questions. Okay, so one of the questions uh, right off the bat says, uh, what do you have to say about people who have successfully gone several months since their, since their last visit with a therapist and are dealing with the challenges of OCD. When does a person seek assistance versus trying to handle the OCD issues on their own? That is an excellent question. Um, and I think it can be tricky to kind of manage life uh, after you have gone through something like ERP, gone through treatment, you feel like you've had some success with it or even a lot of success with it. Just kind of continuing to manage day in and day out after that. Uh, can certainly be a challenge, uh, simply because of the fact that um, OCD symptoms, again, they can kind of ebb and flow. They can kind of come and go as far as their severity and level of intensity throughout a person's lifetime, kind of based on external stressors. Um, and also, unfortunately, it's just kind of the nature of the disorder itself. There may be times where it's more intense for no particular reason, and times it's less intense for no particular reason. Um, so as far as ongoing success in managing symptoms, I think ongoing support is really, really, really important. So one option would be uh, something like an OCD support group. Um, you can either find and attend a live in-person group uh, where you'd be meeting with other people um, who have maybe gone through OCD treatment themselves, maybe they haven't, but it's a chance to really relate to other people that might be in a similar situation, um, can relate to what you're experiencing. And it's always helpful to get ongoing support and feedback from other people uh, also struggling with OCD as far as what they found helpful to them, maybe talk about things that aren't as effective, what hasn't worked, that sort of thing. Um, if you don't have access to something to like a live in-person support group, uh, again, this is a very nice feature of the NoCD app itself. They have an entire online support community, um, which I know can be really constructive and helpful for people as well. Um, it can also be helpful to have a treatment provider you know and trust that you check in with periodically. So. For example, whether it's working with someone through an OCD or working with someone in my private practice, it's very common that I will see someone a lot more frequently when they're first starting treatment, when they're first learning about things like CBT and ERP, trying out exposures, seeing how that whole process goes. Then over time, as the person shows progress and they're feeling more confident in managing their symptoms on their own, um, we kind of gradually phase things out. So maybe we check in once or twice a month, then maybe we're checking in every two to three months, but just to know that there's that ongoing support out there uh, because 
quite frankly, in order to stay on top of this disorder, it's probably gonna be most helpful for you to be engaging in exposures on a pretty regular basis. Um, I've worked with people that really feel the need to continue with the exposure work on a daily basis throughout the course of their lives. And the fact of the matter is that it can be challenging to hold yourself accountable to do that and to continue to do that on your own without any support whatsoever. So having a treatment professional you already know and trust that you can check in with frequently, having that support community, whether it's online or in person, um, that can be really vital in managing OCD uh, over the course of your lifetime. Okay, so uh, another question we're getting here. Um, do therapists, sorry, do therapists bill insurance directly? Um, I'm assuming that is, uh, well, I'll answer both ways. Um, so an OCD, as far as I know, currently uh, does not work with insurance companies. Um, as far as other treatment providers you might see outside, um, everybody's different. So my practice, we do accept a, a few insurances. We do bill um, insurance providers directly. We try and take that step of the process out of it for individuals. But again, everybody's different. There will be some OCD specialists who do not accept any insurance plans whatsoever. There'll be other OCD specialists who do their best to try and accept any and all insurance uh, plans that, that are out there. So it really kind of depends on the individual provider that you are working with. All right, um, it looks like uh, another question here is um, OCD specialists in the Long Island, New York area that accept Medicare and the ERP specialists. So I would make the argument if you're looking for an OCD specialist, you're also looking for an ERP specialist. Um, uh, again, because this is the most effective mode of treatment and that has been backed by research uh, for decades now, um, if you're going to reach out and find someone who specializes in OCD, make sure they practice ERP as well. Uh, my understanding is that uh, NoCD is going to start to offer services with NoCD pros in New York shortly. Don't know exactly when that will be, but that could be one option. Um, for now, I would refer you back to the International OCD Foundation, IOCDF, and I believe their website is just IOCDF.org, uh, um, and they have compiled uh, a list of treatment providers um, literally around the world, um, and I think you can search even by zip code to find someone who is close to you. Again, this is someone who's already been vetted, someone who you can trust, uh, specializes in OCD and ERP, and they'll be able to give you a better idea if they accept something like Medicare as well. Okay, scrolling down here for another question. Um, how, whoops. <laughs> How do you navigate potential therapy options as well as what meds you may feel like you need? Okay, that's that's an excellent question as well. Um, I always tell people this. Um, medication can definitely help with OCD. Does that mean it's going to help everybody? No. So this is why it's so important to uh, have treatment professionals you know and trust who are really willing to look at you as an individual uh, and treat you as an individual. So in my experience, um, it's, it's kind of across the board. Uh, I've certainly seen people that come in um, that are not on medication for their OCD and have responded well enough to things like CBT and ERP that they don't feel the need to go on medication. There are other people that come in and they are trying, working really hard, doing everything they can, um, working CBT, working ERP, and maybe it's been a few weeks, maybe it's been a few months, maybe it's been longer, and for whatever reason, the OCD symptoms continue to be severe enough that they really feel the need to try some medication. They try a medication, they find the right one, it seems to help, and then that combination of the ongoing therapy, the ongoing CBT and ERP, plus medication um, uh, really helps them out. Um, and 
even with that, sometimes people choose to be on medication for a short period of time to help them get things under more control, and then they gradually taper off. Some people, because of the nature of the disorder, they simply need it uh, for longer periods of time. So to me, it's about uh, finding someone, whether it's a therapist or a psychiatrist, who truly understands OCD, who is going to take the time to get to know you and get to know your history and kind of the severity of the symptoms you're struggling with, um, and then kind of go off their recommendations as far as whether or not uh, medication is necessary, uh, what medications to try, and how medication could be best used in conjunction with something like CBT and ERP. Um, to me, um, it, a lot of this, even after someone has gone through treatment, even after someone is having success, better managing their symptoms, um, a lot of it is about maintenance. And for many people, uh, remaining on medication is part of the maintenance plan just to help keep the OCD symptoms at bay. Okay. Uh, another great question here. If my OCD involves specific individuals, would ERP require my exposure to those individuals? Um, it's hard to know if it would require it. There's a good chance it could be beneficial. Um, when it comes to exposure and response prevention, there, there are a few ways to go about exposures. It can be very effective to engage in what are known as in vivo or real life exposures, meaning if there is a clear outward trigger um, that you tend to avoid or shy away from because you're worried about it kind of spiking any of the OCD related symptoms, then yes, over time, you could work your way up to actually facing an individual like that as part of the exposure process. There's also something uh, that is known as imaginal exposures, and these can be very effective when someone's working on uh, managing their OCD as well. And it's basically uh, creating a script. Um, sometimes it's also known as a worst case scenario, and it's just kind of creating the scene uh, and interaction of something you fear and sometimes something, the thing you fear the most coming true. And then that is treated as an exposure, meaning you would create the scene, whether it's through writing it, recording it, that sort of thing, and then you would read through it repeatedly, or you would listen to it repeatedly. And the whole point of exposure work is the more you face something over and over and over again, all the while resisting any urges to engage in compulsions, you know, resisting that urge to avoid it entirely, resisting the urge to seek reassurance that everything's gonna be okay. The more you stay away from that while facing this thing over and over and over again, your anxiety and your distress around that thing, even if it's a person, even if it's an individual, does gradually fade. And you really wanna do stick with exposures until you notice that initial distress you experience in relation to the trigger uh, go down by about 50% or more. And also it's important to do repeated exposures to the same triggers over and over again. So the brain can really start to engage in new learning and start to figure out that these things that the brain once perceived as threats really may not be threats at all and may not require any sort of compulsion um, or action in response to facing them. Okay, these are lots of good questions. How can you do ERP for mental compulsions as opposed to physical? Okay, so as I touched on earlier, uh, very briefly, um, people don't just have to be engaging in outward physical compulsions as part of their OCD. Um, it is just as common, maybe even more common, that people are going through mental processes, uh, mental compulsions, and this can take on many different forms. It can be mentally reviewing situations, mentally reviewing something the person has said or done repeatedly over and over and over again, trying to figure it all out, trying to analyze it, trying to make sure they didn't do anything wrong or bad. Um, people may engage in mental compulsions, like feeling that they need to count things a certain number of times. Um, again, can take any number of forms, maybe kind of uh, rearranging words in, in their own mind. Um, but to me, the most common mental compulsion really seems to be what is known as figuring it all out. It's this ongoing 
analysis, just analyzing anything and everything over and over and over again, even just analyzing an intrusive thought. So an obsession pops into your head, you start thinking about it over and over and over again. What does it mean that I thought that? What can I do about this? Uh, what does it mean about me as a person? What does it mean for my life, my future? Um, how can I fix this? How can I solve it? So mental compulsions um, are, are tricky. Um, and a lot of people do get, get kind of stuck in that trap of going through some sort of mentally compulsive process. So ERP still works for that. Um, one example would be uh, if someone can recognize, okay, when this thought comes into my head, when this specific intrusive thought comes into my mind, here's my typical mental response to that. Here are all the other thoughts I go through. Here are all the different ways I try to pick it apart and analyze it or neutral it, neutralize it. It's very common that if people experience what they perceive as a bad thought, they'll then try and replace it with a good thought and try and neutralize it uh, to that. So I would have someone actually write out a very specific obsession they experience that they can recognize they usually go through some sort of mentally compulsive uh, process in response to. So write out, maybe even say the thought itself out loud, and then really it's on you to make sure that you are doing everything you can to keep yourself out of that mentally compulsive process. Uh, a couple ways that tend to be effective with that, um, if someone's writing an intrusive thought, uh, in order to keep the exposure really focused on that, then I would actually have them just write that one thought itself. So maybe the intrusive thought is maybe something bad will happen to someone I love today. Fairly, fairly common kind of obsession people might experience. So you'd write out that one thought and then just keep writing it repeatedly, all the while making yourself stay focused on that one obsession, that one trigger. The more you do that, you're keeping yourself out of a mentally compulsive process and also learning that you can face this thing over and over and over again and it, you don't have to do anything about it. Um, that's one way. Also, saying something out loud, saying the trigger, saying the intrusive thought repeatedly, um, that is a way to keep the brain kind of focused on one idea itself, one thought itself, and again, stay away from any sort of mental compulsions. Um, but that, that is really an excellent question and it's kind of a, a sticky point in treatment. Um, so coming, coming back to my original point, all this, uh, all the more reason to see and work with someone who really kind of understands all the subtleties and all the nuances that go along with OCD. So you can design very specific exposures to address your individual symptoms that you might be struggling with. Uh, there's another question here about medication. Uh, meds commonly prescribed for individuals with OCD. Um, it, it's, it's kind of all over the place. Um, again, this is why it's important to see an individual psychiatrist who um, is gonna take the time to get to know you and kind of understand how your symptoms present themselves. Uh, it's fairly common that people kind of start with uh, maybe kind of like a, a first line SSRI, uh, something like um, Prozac is, is fairly common. Um, but uh, quite frankly, uh, some people have to try maybe one or two or, or three different kinds of medications until they find something that really uh, addresses their specific symptoms the best. Um, so I always refer people to psychiatrists. I'm not a psychiatrist myself. I can't prescribe medication. So um, I send them to uh, trusted providers that really kind of recognize and understand uh, how OCD works and they'd be able to make the best recommendations as far as what medications could potentially be uh, most effective. Um, another question here is that, uh, is it true that the longer OCD behavior has persisted, the harder it is to overcome? Um, I actually have not found that to be the case. Um, and to me, this is something that kind of depends on the individual. So some people can recognize that they've been engaging in certain OCD behaviors for years, maybe even decades, but at the same time, they're the most willing to try and stop and eradicate that behavior because it is causing the most kind of unrest or causing the most disruption in their lives. So uh, I've certainly worked with plenty of people that even though they can acknowledge this is kind of like a high level item, meaning it's, it's pretty high up there in their hierarchy, 
it causes a lot of distress and anxiety for them to try and stop. They are really motivated to stop it. And that really helps them push themselves through the exposures necessary to stop the behavior. So I could see how that might be the case for some people, but I don't think it has to be the case whatsoever. Um, okay. Another question, can someone who has depression or another disorder still do ERP and is it still as effective? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, I can tell you that it is very common for people with OCD also to experience something like depression. Not all the time, but a lot of the times, the depression is directly related to the OCD itself, meaning people recognize this disorder has become so disruptive and is interfering so much with the life they would prefer to be leading that they then start to feel down and depressed about it. Um, and there are things that go along with OCD that also go along with depression. People can become more isolated and withdrawn. People can kind of lose interest in activities that they once enjoyed uh, because of the sever severity of symptoms. So again, this is, you know, this, this is not the case for everybody, but for a majority of the people I have worked with, once they're better able to get the OCD symptoms under control and really learn how to manage it and they feel like their obsessions and repulsions are not kind of ruling their day-to-day -day life, there's a natural lift in their mood and some of the depressive symptoms also fade away. Um, of course, uh, people might meet criteria for a few different disorders at once. So someone can definitely meet criteria for obsessive compulsive disorder and major depressive disorder at the same time. Um, there are kind of different treatment methods you could use to address the depression itself, but by no means would it, would, would it preclude having the individual be able to go through and effectively learn how to implement ERP. Okay, so we got time for one more question. Um, we have so many here. Okay. Uh, I'll end with this one. Um, and again, if uh, you have ongoing questions, um, anything uh, you want to try to address or talk about with uh, me or a clinician like myself, uh, feel free to sign up for the free 15 minute consultation uh, through NoCD. Um, and again, uh, if you do that, you can trust you're going to be talking with an OCD specialist, someone who really understands the ins and outs of this disorder. But the last one I'll take is, what are your thoughts on OCD advocacy by those with OCD? Can one be an advocate while still living with the challenges of OCD? That is a great question. Um, to me, I think it can be a very rewarding part of treatment for someone with OCD to start then to advocate to help others with OCD. Um, you know, one of the reasons that OCD is becoming better recognized, even though it's still widely misunderstood, but it is becoming better recognized both by individuals with OCD and treatment professionals is because so many people with OCD have had the courage to start to speak out more about what their experience has been um, and just be very honest and open about some of the symptoms they've experienced and really get into detail about all kind of the different ways OCD has impacted their lives. And along with that, talk about what has helped them learn how to overcome their own OCD. The more people with OCD are able to really kind of take that chance and speak up about their experiences. It's a way to reach others who may not fully understand the disorder, may not fully understand what they're going through, and maybe people who are reluctant or flat out scared to seek help for it because of what they're experiencing. So I think OCD advocacy for someone who has OCD can actually be a very powerful form of treatment in conjunction with um, any other sort of hope they have been receiving. So yes, I'm all for OCD advocacy, whether you are someone with OCD or someone who is passionate about treating it. Um, so just remember that even though this event itself was live, if you're interested in um, kind of going back or uh, seeing any of the content again, it will be on OCD's YouTube channel. And uh, anybody who is interested, please do not hesitate to reach out for help. There's very effective help out there. Um, there are people like myself out there who are passionate about treating this and would like to help you.
So please don't hesitate.